All right, ladies and gentlemen, the uh, clock on the wall says one, so that means it is time for our next lecture. And this lecture is going to be called Growth Theory, Two Views. And uh, it turns out that there are a lot more than two views of growth uh, in the economics literature. Uh, a casual survey of uh, Snowden and Vane's modern macroeconomics identifies at least 14 uh, theories of growth. I will not cover 14. Um, I will cover a little more than two narrowly defined, but you will find that what I'm going to be contrasting is sort of the uh, Misesian praxeological understanding of economic progress and contrasting that with modern growth theory. Um, as we talk about it, um, uh, as I have proceeded in, in my research, um, I've come across a number of uh, more recent uh, pieces of the literature that are there for you to peruse. Of course, you could preface any suggested readings with, of course, the classics. I read Manger, Bumbavirk, Mises, Rothbard, et cetera. Uh, but uh, also, um, there's a, the most recent uh, piece of literature I've looked at is a, an article uh, by uh, Victor Espinosa in uh, the um, uh, Market Processes uh, Journal of European Political Economy. It's a Spanish-English bilingual journal uh, on epistemological problems on development economics. I highly recommend that piece. I think it's very insightful. Um, then there are some works there by Randall Holcomb, uh, Jesus Huerta de Soto, and then the late uh, Suda Shinoy. And um, that's the, the, the bulk of the literature I've been drawing upon, uh, building uh, on top of, of course, the uh, you know, the, the standard bearers for Austrian economics. Uh, my understanding is these slides are available uh, online too, so we don't have, you don't have to copy this down now. You can take a photo of it, but it's going away fairly quickly, and by that I mean now. Uh, so as we talk about um, economic uh, progress, economic expansion development, um, I think it's important to realize that um, this is a topic that's similar to business cycle theory in that um, it, uh, a general theory explaining economic uh, progress, like a general theory explaining business cycles, uh, must be holistic. It must draw together um, a lot of strands of uh, economic theory. I remember, I can't remember in, 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 if it was Rothbard or Mises mentioned that you know, often the, the, the chapter on business cycle is the last chapter in the book of, of, a, of an economics text because it requires knowing all of the everything before that to pull it together. Well, economic expansion development is, is also is, is similar. It must be holistic. And so that means uh, that it is you know, theorizing and having a, a good understanding of economic progress requires both analysis and synthesis. Uh, analysis in identifying and explaining the various particular processes that contribute to economic prosperity. Uh, that's the analysis part. We want to explain why all of these processes work together to enjoy prosperity as well. That's the synthesis, right? It, it's not enough to just sort of identify these arbitrary things in the abstract. A good theory, and this is where praxeology has a leg up, I should, I should say, on the competition. We can explain how these things work together. We can, we can show how they, we can show the synthesis, how they work together to actually uh, provide uh, for a process of economic progress. And as I was putting the, the uh, lecture together, it struck me also that the specific sources, or what I call engines of prosperity, for lack of a better term, uh, we've already been acquainted with in uh, the theoretical uh, lectures, uh, the vast majority of these sources. For instance, uh, one uh, economic theory tells us that one of the sources of prosperity is specialization and the division of labor. Right? That was the, the subject of a lecture by this, this guy named Rittenauer. Uh, he talked <laughs> about uh, the law of association right? and how specializing according to efficiency and cooperative action is more efficient and hence more productive than isolated action of self-sufficient individuals. And so the more extensive the division of labor is, the more productive we are, the more economic progress, the economic prosperity we can enjoy. 
Um, in another couple of lectures, uh, we talked about, uh, you heard about the, the importance of capital accumulation uh, from Patrick Newman. And then uh, the Austrian capital theory, uh, the theory of capital theory was applied by Jonathan Newman explaining sustainable development in his uh, lecture on uh, business cycles. Right? Uh, you saw how saving and investment allows for both widening and deepening the uh, capital structure, which then increases our productivity and allows people then to uh, benefit by obtaining more goods uh, that they can use to satisfy their ends at lower prices. Um, a third source of prosperity or engine of prosperity, which hasn't been touched on as, in as much detail, is uh, technology. Uh, technology, of course, is important. Um, it's, I would argue, emphasized too much in modern uh, growth theory, but it is important uh, because not, technology is, is simply the knowledge regarding how to do something. Right? It's a recipe for how to produce something. And of course, you know, uh, if, 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 if you don't have a good recipe, you can't make a good flourless chocolate cake, right? Uh, you just can't do it. And so a recipe is important. I know there are some who was wondering if I was going to be able to bring up that great dessert, and the answer is yes. So um, you need technology. A technology, uh, a technical advance, advances to technology contributes to economic progress in at least three ways. Uh, one, it um, provides for more productive capital goods, right? Think of the technology uh, of a hand whisk versus the technology of a stand-up mixer, right? But the stand-up mixer is more productive in, than, than, than a hand whisk, right? So some technology is more advanced than others. Some technology allows for capital goods to be more productive than others. Um, another type of technology is the arrangement of the production process itself. And so a technological advance could be in the form of a more uh, productive production process. A good example of this would be Walmart's uh, warehouse arrangement, their, their cross-docking system that they developed. They developed a system where merchandise containers come into their warehouse on trucks, into their distribution centers, and then are immediately unloaded and reloaded on trucks that go right out to the stores. Right? And so they don't have uh, containers full of goods sitting in a warehouse for any length of time, or hardly any length of time. And that greatly reduces then the time from which the good comes from the manufacturer to, it goes out to the retail store, reducing uh, transportation costs, reducing uh, the time element, and hence making their operation more productive, um, less costly, so they can then, you know, uh, theoretically uh, pass on their lower prices to the, um, to the populace, right? That the, 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 the consumer benefits from this more efficient warehousing process, and that is a type of technology. Right? Um, thirdly, a technology uh, allows for economic progress in providing a larger variety of higher quality consumer goods that can serve more, more of our ends. Think of, uh, well, in my, in my dining room at home back in Pennsylvania, I have, I think, perhaps the only family heirloom that, that we have passed down to us, and it was my grandparents' uh, telephone, and it was one of those, uh, tele those crank telephones, right? It's, it's on the wall, and you have to pick up the, 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 the hand thing or the ear thing and put it up here, and the speaker's up on the wall, and you have to, you have to crank, and, and depending on how many times you cranked, then the, uh, the, the, the operator would know, oh, that's the, the Pierman household, or that's the Rittenauer household, and then they would do the pluggy thing, and then they could connect it to whoever. And of course, if you were, you know, starred for entertainment because there was no TV, you just pick up the line. If, if you hear a ring, you pick up the line, and you can hear, you know, the conversations from other people on the party line to sort of say, well, what's hap what, what are the Smiths up to this week? <laughs> oh, death in the family. Uh, sorry. Uh, so um, it can happen. Um, so that, that was the, the telephone technology circa 1945, shall we say, or 1940 in western Nebraska. Um, now, of course, we have smarty phones, right? 
you, you don't have to, there's no cranking, you just, you pick it up and sh like this. I mean, you, th there is, there's, you know, you have the flip phone, which I thought was pretty cool when it came out. It took me about 15 years to get one of those. Uh, but now, of course, you have the smarty phone that you can talk, you do the computer, you do GPS, you can listen to music, you can be distracted in innumerable ways, right? So that's, that's also a way that technological advance provides for economic progress. It allows people to have goods uh, that can serve more of their ends uh, than, you know, than was even thought possible 50 years ago. And so technology is important. Uh, the fourth um, source of prosperity, however, is one that you have heard a lot about uh, from uh, Dr. Klein, for instance, Peter Klein, that's entrepreneurship, right? Um, entrepreneurship is important because all of the production in the economic order, all of the production in the economic order requires entrepreneurial judgment. It requires decisions to do something and therefore a decision not to do something else. Right? And this is important because just as, as Mises uh, puts it himself, capital does not beget profit. Right? Just having capital doesn't mean you're going to be profitable, doesn't mean you're going to be productive per se. It is possible to waste capital that's already been accumulated. You could accumulate ca capital through saving and investment and then squander it, producing something that, that nobody wants, the, sort of the anti zig zig ah, so to speak, that you really don't want, that you really, really don't want or something. I don't know how you, it doesn't really, it's not as catchy, but uh, you get the picture. Um, now, why is this the case? Well, as, as uh, Dr. Klein pointed out, production decisions are production decisions made in the present based on a forecast of uncertain future market conditions. And if the producer, the entrepreneur, forecasts incorrectly, he will use his capital making something that people do not want enough to pay a higher enough price to cover the cost of production. And if he does that, he will be a loser. Right? He'll be a loser. And that's no way to make America great again. <laughs> and so, so nobody wants to be a loser. So entrepreneurs are important. They're very important, right? You don't want to squander the scarce resources that we have. Um, additionally, entrepreneurs drive economic progress through innovation. They are the ones that are always looking to produce new and different products in new and different ways so as to best satisfy the consumers so that they can reap larger profits. And so they uh, earn profits precisely for serving other people, right? And so um, these entrepreneurial judgments, entrepreneurship is huge, and this is an area that is woefully neglected in modern growth theory. Um, modern uh, or entrepreneurs have to make judgments on many margins, right? Uh, it's not just about knowing how many units of output, of widgets to produce, and how many units of capital and labor to utilize, right? Um, the, 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 the judgments that entrepreneurs have to make with regard to the product deals, they have to decide what type of product to produce, what quality of product do they want to produce, where do they want to produce it, where should they locate the production process, what should be the scale of operations, how, how big of plant do we want to uh, use. Um, the time of, av of availability, how long do we want the production process to take? Uh, what's the economically wise duration of production? Um, as well as they have to anticipate the price that buyers are potentially willing to pay for the product. They have to do all of that. At the same time, they have to make a whole lot of decisions related to um, investment. Right? They have to make decisions about the relative level of capital intensity, uh, capital intensity of the production process. They have to make decisions about how durable cap uh, of capital goods they want to invest in purchasing. They need to make decisions about how specific of capital goods, what the capital specificity, how specific the capital goods uh, need to be or are warranted for our production process. They need also, of course, to make decisions about the quantity of the capital goods and the labor. Uh, they have to make decisions about what, what quality of labor do we have to hire. They have to make decisions about do we want to hire workers that are already fully trained in this area or can we hire them and then train them up. There's a whole host of those kind of decisions related to the factors of production that they have to make. They have to make entrepreneurial decisions related to technology. Right? 
Um, they have to make the decisions related to the technology embedded in the consumer good characteristics, right? What, what features do we want to put in the smarty phone? And what features can we leave out? Um, we need to, they have to make decisions about the technology and the production process. What type of warehousing system do we want to have? What type of mixer do we want to utilize in making a flourless chocolate cake? They have to make those decisions about what type of technology is going to be embedded in capital goods. And then they also need to make decisions uh, related to how much research and development we want to engage in or can afford to engage in ourselves versus how much maybe we want to utilize from people maybe we can contract with. Right? And so the decisions, the, the, the number of margins that entrepreneurs have to make judgments uh, with respect to is, uh, is very large, extremely large. And so entrepreneurship is extremely crucial for explaining the process of economic progress. And as Salerno noted in his lecture on calculation, entrepreneurs need to use economic calculation if they are to coordinate economic, the economic order. If they're to coordinate all of the production that takes place at all of these stages within the production structure, in all of the industries in the market division of labor, all of that activity has to be coordinated. And it has to be coordinated in such a way that the hired goods are available when the producers that use those higher order goods need them to be produced so that they can produce a product that will be where and when their customers need them to be. And so they need to use economic calculation using market prices to direct factors of production toward their most highly valued uses and to coordinate the entire market division of labor, the entire social economy. Now, uh, one of, and so in some sense, that's the, the, the analysis, right? Identifying those separate sources of prosperity um, that, that contribute to economic progress. The synthesis is important, however, too, because there, there's a tendency, and I, it must be as a part of human nature, to identify like the one thing. Like the one, this finally explains economic development. You know, for a while, everybody thought, oh, it's capital. Then, oh, no, it's technology. Then, oh, no, it's human capital. Well, no, then it's institutions. No, it's not institutions. It's culture, right? It's like there's only one thing that explains economic expansion development. Well, a praxeological view, I think, is more robust. It's one that recognizes that economic progress is not monocausal, right? I mean, it's, it, it's only monocausal in the sense that, yeah, it's the result of human action. <laughs> but then isn't everything. Uh, no, it, it's not monocausal. All of these sources have to work together, right? And, and, and so you don't, that, that you, you can't really, in explaining the actual historical process of economic development, uh, you can't neatly separate the sources in isolation from one another and, and sort of then assume that they all sort of participate in the abstract, right? They all work together. For example, a highly developed division of labor would simply be impossible without the accumulation and use of capital goods. And likewise, and so the existence of capital goods and saving an investment in capital goods and the accumulation of capital is, is, is like the other side of the division of labor coin, right? They go, they go together, like, like Romeo and Juliet or peanut butter and jelly. They go together. Um, yeah, Samson and Delilah for a little while. Uh, uh, at the same time, like the, the entrepreneur, the entrepreneur must reveal, or I'm sorry, must invest in real capital. The entrepreneur it doesn't operate in the abstract either. He must invest real capital in the production process for anything to actually be produced. At the same time, as I've already mentioned, capital per se never guarantees economic progress either because it must be widely utilized, or wisely utilized. It must be invested productively. And if the producer errs in his market forecast, he can indeed reap large losses. At the same time, for technology to be productive, it must be bound up in actual capital goods. And so technology, for it to be effective in the production process, requires saving and investment. For someone to benefit from technology, it is not enough just to know that the technology exists, to know that a machine suitable for the task exists. It must be possessed, right? Um, in order to make a flourless chocolate cake, 
it's not enough just to know the recipe, right? You have to have the semi-sweet chocolate, the butter, and the eggs, and the stand-up mixer, and the spring form pan, and the electricity, and the conventional oven, and the uh, microwave oven. You have to have that capital that you've previously invested in to put the technology to work. So without capital investment, technology is of no use. But with capital investment, Technology will tend to advance as entrepreneurs continually seek to obtain and use better, more productive capital goods. And so these sources of prosperity uh, work together. Right? They work together, and they're brought together by the entrepreneur. Right? They're coordinated by the entrepreneur. So we could say economic progress. Economic progress is the happy consequence of a highly developed division of labor, taking advantage of an increasing capital stock, embodying better technology, wisely invested by entrepreneurs. That's, that's why economic progress occurs. It's a happy consequence. This is, this is not the dismal science. We're the happy science. We're the joyful science, right? Now, this general theory of economic progress it has implications for institutions. Um, it uh, tells us that uh, private property is crucial for the flourishing of all of these uh, sources of, 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 um, of progress. We can only specialize in producing certain things if we can trade our excess supply for other goods to get other goods that we want. So we need to be able to participate in voluntary exchange. It's voluntary exchange that opens up the door to the benefits of the market division of labor. And so we have to be able to engage in voluntary exchange, which occurs in a society rooted in private property. At the same time, people have to have an incentive to save and invest in capital for them to do so. And people have an incentive to save and invest in capital only if they have an insurance or have some expectation that they can do with their capital, what seems best. And if they can keep the positive returns from their capital investment. If, 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 if an investor is always you know, in fear of government confiscation, right? you know, if, if, if like, like the sort of Damocles is, of, of confiscation is hanging over their head and they don't ever know when the cord is going to get cut and shoo, down, comes, down comes the sword. Right? They're going to be skittish. They're not going to be as eager to make long-term capital investments. And therefore, the capital structure will be narrower, it will be uh, shorter, and the society will be less prosperous. Likewise, in order to benefit from technological advance, people have to have the incentive to research, to develop, and innovate, and utilize better technology. And they will have that incentive if, again, they're able to benefit from the gains that are associated with developing and utilizing better technology. And if they have the freedom to research, to do research in the areas that they want to do research in. And likewise, entrepreneurs can calculate profit and loss only if their calculations are guided by market prices. And those prices are only meaningful and helpful in economic calculation in actually helping entrepreneurs to direct factors of production towards the, their uses that are actually more valuable to people, those prices, for those prices to be meaningful, they have to be market prices, free market prices, prices determined by voluntary exchange. Because only prices that are determined by voluntary exchange are manifestations of um, subjective preferences. And so the link between right, the subjective preferences of people in society and the physical objective goods that are produced is economic calculation and the market prices that are used in the economic calculation. Um, another uh, social institution that also um, sort of undergirds w effective coordination by entrepreneurs is sound money, right? Sound money, money that is not continually being manipulated significantly by the state or by the monetary authority because to the extent that the state manipulates the money supply, um, that will alter the purchasing power of money, alter the pricing structure, and driving the pricing structure away, in some sense, towards uh, to a certain extent, sort of fictitious values. Um, it can make things look like they're more profitable when really they're not. Right? And that sort of is, is 
is sort of part of the seed of the business cycle. Right? So sound money is also an important uh, institution that uh, fosters and allows for the development of economic progress. So that's one theory of growth. It's pulling together everything that we've seen and just recognizing that for economic progress, we need the market division of labor, capital accumulation, technological advance, and wise entrepreneurship that coordinates the whole ball of wax, so to speak. What about the other story? What about the other view? Well, we could say the other view is modern development economics. And uh, development economics, modern development economics uh, emerged as uh, the economic development of poorer countries, we call less developed countries, became an issue relevant for the plans for post-World War II reconstruction on the part of the major powers. And the, develop, the, the sort of the history uh, of, the, of, of development economics, modern development economics, is a culmination of a historical process incorporating many factors. Uh, one of which is just the so-called the golden age of Keynesianism. Right, the golden age of Keynesianism um, that stretched, the text will say stretched from 1948 to 73. Uh, it was a period that uh, looked like, uh, according to certain people, certain statistics, looked like, hey, we got, we got this macro management thing under control. Right? It's, it's, a, it's, the air, it's the area of Keynes, and we can you know, uh, increase deficit spending, and then when, and, and to get us out of recessions, and then we can, you know, we can, you know, <laughs> run budget surpluses. <laughs> Wait, we want to cool down the economy, right? Um, theoretically, um, and so we can manage things, right? That's the, the so-called golden age of Keynesian. It, it petered out in the 1970s when we had both high unemployment and high price inflation, and that didn't <laughs> did not compute. Um, so I like to, the, the golden age of Keynesian. It's like the golden age of television. Right? The so-called golden age of television. Everything was in black and white, and no one really knew what they were doing. That's sort of how you could conceive of it. Um, uh, another uh, aspect to this that made development economics sort of appealing was the Marshall Plan. Uh, you know, the conventional wisdom about the Marshall Plan, uh, regardless of what, actu you know, what actually happened, the Marshall Plan seemed to rebuild Europe. And it was this great rebuilding uh, program that made it look like, hey, if we just put our minds together, if we put our, our, our economic policies together, we can take economies that were in rubble and make them uh, very productive, right? And so it, it, it uh, gave some uh, you know, good vibes towards the idea of economic planning. Uh, thirdly, the development of national income statistics, uh, such as uh, GNP and GDP, et cetera, um, documented uh, vast economic inequalities between the more developed countries and the less developed countries. And so it, in, 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 in sort of, again, in black and white, you could see, ah, the GDP of the US is here, and the GDP of, say, I don't know, uh, uh, you know the Congo is here. And so we've got a lot of poor people here, and we just need to lift them up to get them up into the upper echelon to make the less developed countries and more developed countries. So it sort of, it was used as effective um, motive for, you know, we've got to do something. Um, also, part and parcel with this is the creation of a number of international aid agencies, such as the United Nations, the IMF, the World Bank. Uh, they directed many resources towards the issue of economic development in the less developed countries, right? So that's where the money was. The money, research dollars went flowing in to uh, economists and, and research institutions that spent time investigating and, and, and you know, churning out uh, studies about how to help less developed countries. And those studies, of course, are going to appeal to the people that are spending the money. Right? They're, they're, they're studies that want to appeal to the, to, the, to the wishes of the planners. And also say along this line is sort of the fifth thing that happened that contributed to this process of the development of development economics is the development of modern growth models. The development of modern growth models. And those modern growth models, and they're gonna be ones we're gonna be talking about uh, for the rest of the time probably, uh, implied that there's an investment gap or there's some gap. It, they, we, they came up with a gap theory of poverty. Right? The gap theory of poverty. Um, there was some type of gap, some type of gap in the lives of the less developed, people in less developed countries that is causing them to remain poor. 
And with the right government intervention, we can fill the gap and everything will be hunky-dory. Right? Everything will be hunky-dory. And so uh, what I want to talk about next is, is sort of modern macro growth models and the poverty trap. Um, there are at least sort of three approaches, three different models, if you will, of uh, growth theory you want to touch on. The first is the Herod Domar model. The Herod Domar model is sort of the, 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 the purest of the, Kane, of, the, of the Keynesian type models. It's developed in a simple Keynesian cross framework where Y is output and that's equal to consumption spending plus investment spending, C plus I. C is for consumption, not, not for cooking. Uh, consumption, I is for investment. And uh, investment is spending on uh, investment in physical production, right? So it's not investment in stocks, not investment in bonds, but in, it's investment in capital goods used for producing goods, economic goods. Uh, C is just spending on household consumption. And Herod Doma, uh, Domar, the two of them, they're two different people, sort of independently developed very similar, very similar model using the Keynesian system, and so the model is known as the, the, the Herod Domar model. And the conclusion is that the rate of growth in GDP, the rate of growth in output, is equal to the savings rate divided by the capital to output ratio minus depreciation. And the, the great implication is that the higher the rate of saving and investment, the higher the growth rate. The higher the rate of saving and investment, the higher the growth rate. In some sense, so far, so good. I mean, it would make sense. If we save and invest more, right? the options say, okay, if you save and invest more, you widen and lengthen the production structure, it, we will be more prosperous. Right? But they, what, they, what they viewed as investment was a little bit different. Right? We're going to talk about that in a little bit. Um, this, the second sort of modern growth model we want to talk about is the neoclassical growth model, uh, developed by an economist named uh, Robert Solo and then also an economist named Swan, again, sort of independently, but sort of then gets mashed together. And this model is very interesting. It models the entire economy as one giant short-run neoclassical production function. Right? So that, that's a neoclassical production function there, um, showing a, a K, capital, on the horizontal axis, and Y, output on the vertical axis. This, by the way, that's the micro foundation for macroeconomics. Right? The micro foundation is modeling the entire economy as if it's one giant firm, right? And so somebody has to make a production decision for the entire firm. Um, the uh, production constraint there, if you look up there, that's y at time t is equal to a at time t times the function of k times t. There's also labor in there, but because it's a short run production function, the assumption in this case is that labor is constant because they're wanting to, Solo's wanting to investigate what's the relationship between capital investment and output. And if labor is constant, and a, by extension, if land is constant, and we increase capital, what are you going to get? You're going to get a diminishing returns. Diminishing returns. And so that's why we have this sort of uh, the shape of the production function that we get. Notice, though, in front of the function, on the right hand side of the, uh, the equation, but in front of the function, there's this A at time t. Now, A is what's called the productivity shift factor, the productivity shift factor. It represents the shocks to the production process. Right? Shocks to the production process. The shock to a production process is anything that changes total factor productivity. Anything that changes total factor productivity, otherwise known as TFP. Um, that's not to be confused with MFP, which you should get with Colgate. That's maximum fluoride protection. But TFP is total factor productivity. And total factor productivity is essentially the level of output forthcoming for given levels of labor and capital outputs. In other words, it's not just the productivity of land or the productivity of labor or the productivity of capital. It's not the marginal product of any one of those. It's a measurement of the total productivity of all the factors. Right? And um, often, this A is seen to be sort of a measurement uh, for technology. Right? The idea is, is, is as technology increases, all the factors become more productive, so total factor productivity goes up. And uh, so what, what's, what's, what do we get from this this uh, model. What do we get from this? Uh, what are the conclusions here? Well, because of diminishing returns to capital, 
an increased capital investment eventually will yield a maximum output, right? You get diminishing returns, and so if you keep use, adding more and more and more and more capital with the fixed amount of labor, at some point, we'll reach maximum output, and we can't do better than that, right? So it puts a limit on how much output we can get through increased capital investment. Right? And that's why people recognize that the solo model tended to predict that there would be a convergence eventually between more, de uh, more developed countries and less developed countries. As both more developed countries and less developed countries start increasing their capital production, the more developed countries, as they increase their capital investment, will reach the, 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 the sweet spot, the max spot, and then they'll just stop with capital investment. And the less developed countries will continue until they also get to that stop, that point, and they'll stop. And so there will be, tend to be a convergence between the less developed countries and the more developed countries. That's one sort of implication of the model. Another implication of the model is that if we want to have continued economic expansion, once we hit the maximum amount of output we get from capital, the only way to increase output then is through technology. We need a positive technology shock. And that's what's illustrated on that graph, right? The shift from the bottom uh, function to the top is a result of a positive technological advance. We have a, a new way of doing things. We have the development of the internet or the development of, of you know, air conditioning or the development of who knows what that affects everything. And so everything is more productive. And you can see them if you look here at the, uh, the same amount of uh, capital investment you now get a higher level of output. So that's the, that's the beauty of technological advance in this model. Right? There was a, th a certain economist, Paul Romer, was looking at the data and didn't see as much convergence as he thought we should, uh, given the solo model. And he saw that, well, the United States continued to increase their productivity and continue to grow for decades. Uh, what explains this? Well, he said it was the way technolog technology grows. He developed the endogenous growth model. Um, he argued that, uh, okay, yes, in the short run, there can be diminishing marginal returns to capital, but they are offset by increases in technology and it turns out that there are certain things about technology, he argues, that when we have a capital investment in tech, that's related to technology, that can sort of take on a life of its own. There could be increases, increasing returns to uh, technology. Um, the idea here is the more we know, the easier it is to discover more knowledge. So if we engage in some research and development and we learn certain things, that makes it easier for us to learn even more things. And so, you know, uh, like, like the old, uh, there's an old uh, shampoo commercial. This, remember this, this lady said something like, oh, I, 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 tried, I tried this one shampoo and I just loved it. And then I told two friends, and then I told two friends, and they started to multiply. And the next thing you know, you have like 64 pictures of the same woman on the screen uh, telling you about how great the shampoo is. Well, that's sort of like, it's like a geometric progression, right? So geometric progression and the thing sort of just takes off. And so we can overcome, we overcome diminishing returns to capital because of endogenous uh, increases in technology. And Paul Romer argues that one of the reasons that the United States has continued to grow um, uh, is because that the US had, uh, more, had or has more people devoted to the knowledge discovery process. We pour more human resources into research, development, and innovation. Also, the United States developed research universities and research grants. And that is the key, in his mind, to explaining why we have this technological progress that has taken off and has helped us overcome the diminishing returns to capital. So those are the three models we can, con we can, we can sort of contrast praxeology with uh, in six minutes. Um, these models fomented what I call, I don't call it, they call the gap theory. Uh, it was the, the investment gap, uh, but there's, 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 just like there's many growth theories, there's many gaps. So I'm just calling it the gap theory. The gap theory 
is, is, is a, uh, a theory that says less developed countries are mired in poverty because they're stuck in the poverty trap. Right? They're stuck in a poverty trap and they can't walk out, right? to quote Elvis Presley. Um, they're stuck in the poverty trap. Why? Right? Well, one is the investment gap. Jeffrey Sachs uh, sort of, the investment gap is something that goes way back to the 1950s at least. Um, it was uh, re, re, uh, sort of rehabilitated by Jeffrey Sachs in his work, uh, The End of Poverty. And it goes something like this. Um, take the case of the impoverished household in a less developed country. All of his income goes to consumption just to stay alive. Right? And if all of his in income goes to consumption just to stay alive, he has no personal savings. So there's low saving and therefore low investment. There's low investment in capital formation. The productivity remains low. With low productivity, there's low employment and also low income. And because there's low income, there's low amounts of savings. Because there's low savings, there's low investment, low investment, small stock of capital, low productivity, low income low savings, and it's just a circle, right? It's, just a, it's a vicious circle that leads to perpetual impoverishment. Right? Um, once the idea of diminished returns to capital become, became uh, popular in modern growth theory, um, attention turned away from the investment gap in, ca in capital investment towards what we call the technology gap. The, the, the real gap, it turns out, once, 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 once the idea was, oh, well, the reason why we have continual growth is actually through technological advance, the reason people are still poor must be the technology gap. Right? Societies are impoverished, not just not because they don't have enough capital, because it's argued capital is not where it's at, it's technology. They don't have enough technology. Right? The technology is, 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 is possessed by and used by the more developed countries. The less developed countries don't have enough technology. They're less productive because they don't have technology. And because they don't have technology, they're less productive. They have lower incomes. They have less saving and capital accumulation, which keeps them lagging behind the more developed countries. Now, the implication of all these gaps, uh, by the way, the technology gap has also given way to now the human capital gap, right? The real problem now is not so much technology because I mean, even as Mises pointed out, uh, technology, because it's just how, knowing how to do things, you can, you can learn technology from reading scientific books, right? So it's not really a matter of know-how. Maybe, maybe the problem is human capital. People don't know that people don't have the skills to utilize the technology. So it's a human capital gap, right, that's holding everybody back. But with all these gaps, the solution always is intervention, right? investment in foreign aid. If we, have, if we pour enough foreign aid into these societies, we can fill the gaps. Right? If it's an investment gap, we give foreign aid to fill that investment gap, and then product, uh, productivity will take off. If we um, pour money into technology, the technology gap will be, will be bridged, so then those societies will take off and become more prosperous, et cetera, et cetera. Well, what do we say about this? Well, in the first place, we could say that the poverty trap itself has been refuted by the empirical evidence. Um, over the past 100 years, just look at the data. Over the past 100 years, there's been a continuous, widespread decrease in worldwide poverty. The number of people that are living in extreme poverty is significantly less now than it was even 30 years ago. And so, if there's a poverty trap of some sort, it doesn't seem to be universal. Uh, P.T. Bauer noted this in the 1960s even, writing an article on the vicious cycle of poverty where he noted that the existence of more developed countries right now, per se, refutes the poverty trap. Right? I mean, we did develop somehow before foreign aid. How is that possible, right, if, if the poverty trap theory is true? Um, more specifically, uh, William Easterly has uh, written a couple of really good articles about the efficacy or lack thereof of foreign aid. And in, in one study, he looked at something like 88 different countries uh, from, I want to say, 65 to 85 or something like that, and uh, found uh, very little, very little evidence that foreign invest or foreign aid actually enhances investment of any kind, and virtually zero evidence that investment driven by foreign aid results in 
increased economic growth. And so uh, the data, the, the empirical evidence, the, the, the both, shall we say, the, the, if you want to call it this, the, the econometric and the economic historical data refute um, the theory, the, the gap theory. Um, and I would argue that the history refutes the poverty trap theory, the gap theory, because of a host of um, theoretical problems a host of problems with the economic framework, um, one of which, I mean, in some sense, it's simply that these models are guilty of four out of the five forms of scientism mentioned in Rothbard's Mantle of Science. If you've never read Rothbard's article, Mantle of Science, I encourage you to do so. Um, he lists five, and four out of five are right here. So as, as Meatloaf would say, I think four out of five ain't bad. Um, and, but unfortunately, you're going to have to read about this by looking at my notes because I'm out of time. <laughs>